It's Dave Lawrence, and uh, thank you for joining us. We're having a very special little uh, mid-show chat, I guess you would say. One show's done, another one's still to go. It's guitarist Steve Kimock and keyboardist Jeff Comenti, and these guys are in town doing a run of dates, Steve Kimock and Friends, and we had Steve on the phone, you may or may not recall, and we're following it up with a little chat at the venue. Steve, great to see you again. Nice to see you, and nice to be here. Thank you for, for aloha and, and mahalo for that. And you, nice to meet you, Jeff. Likewise, nice to meet you. And these two cats, as you probably know if you heard the phone interview with Steve, uh, strong associations with the Grateful Dead from, from both of these dudes. First, how long have you known Brother Jeff? Jeez. 2006, seven. No, actually, I met you the very first time. I met you 20 years ago. Wow. Any memory on you? No. We were rehearsing with the dead at the time. for, um, And you came by Belmarin. You got a big old beard. <laughs> <laughs> and you were like just getting ready. Maybe you were mid-tour. Or we can't remember. but And that was the very first time we met. But the very first time we played was probably when uh, we did with Rat Dog together which was probably 2006 or seven, something like that. But. That's very cool. That's very, very cool. He has two brain cells left to rub together. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Those are the only two I got. <laughs> so you guys have a little bit of history together, and of course both of them have this, uh, this shared love of the Grateful Dead. We were talking to Steve about, about some of that the other day, and Steve, you were sharing your first experience getting to work with the cats was Donna Jean and Keith, yeah? That's exactly right, yeah. And about, what, 79, 80? Yeah, and there's somewhere, I guess, shortly after they left the Grateful Dead, you know, but I don't, I don't remember, it was so long ago, I don't remember the year. And understandably, it has been a while, and then you've, you've added so many experiences. He does. Well, I was, you know, I was kind of <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty, much a, pretty much a free spirit, really, back then, <laughs> you know, so it was not, not, or as, or as, uh, as Rylan might say. My favorite number of the alphabet is pink. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Uh, he's definitely a, a good way to start, though, with, with those uh, particular cats. When was your first experience uh, getting to work with any of the cats? Uh, it was Bob Weir when I started in 1997. Okay, so it was Rat, it was rat Dog. Rat Dog, yes. And I had, like, shame to say, but I just really had, I had no Grateful Dead experience. I didn't know any of their music. I obviously knew of them, but it was kind of a fluke how we got into that fold. And, how? Uh, I was working at the time with Dave Ellis, the saxophone player, and we had a. I was part of his jazz quartet, and he ended, ended just uh, ended up getting the Rat Dog gig at that point, and just kind of casually said, "Hey, if you happen to need some keys to jam with, let me know." And then, like two days later, he called and said, "You're not going to believe it. they're looking for a keyboard player," and, <laughs> and that's all she wrote. And then from that, the transition on, you've gotten to work with a number of others, so you've done some, you know, obviously you're still part of the fold with, with their current enterprise. Uh, explain what happened after Rato. Just kind of playing along, next thing you know, it's like they, was, they reformed the, uh, the dead as the other ones, and then slash into the dead, but it was just like, you're in. And just kind of from that, I mean, I, had, I was doing some stuff with Phil side, with Phil Lesh and Friends, and then... Uh, was and shortly after did some stuff a little bit with Mickey and then Billy came into the fold with the dead stuff so by that time that was the core four were back together and I was you know honored to be a part of that and ever since so. and and musically Steve was telling the story about uh, he was really the dead was a something that was still foreign to him when he was in high school he was just getting exposed to it parties and stuff he was more like a, a Sabbath guy that was one of the bands that, that he had dropped a name of and uh, and we were riffing on that Tony Iommi and Jerry two distinctive guitar players yourself where were you in terms of like your own inspirations musically was meaning when you got the opportunity to, to do the thing with Rat Dog were you a fan at all or was this just a great opportunity uh, it was a great opportunity I honestly like I said I didn't know the stuff and then once I started like getting into it and then all of a sudden it was like we, uh, Bob decided that hey we want to start pulling out some of the chestnuts and I started going through the catalog and started making charts and doing all that stuff and I was listening listening I was going my god there's like so much great music how the hell did I miss this you know you know but I was just more than I was in the jazz world basically you know and it was, that was my upbringing and uh, I was very fortunate there I was doing well for myself and playing with a lot of people a lot of opportunities and stuff but um, once I 
got into that, I kind of had to like jump in all the way. Otherwise, I was right. going to get swallowed up. <laughs> and you have stayed in it to, to, with to great success. I mean, so it was a huge opportunity uh, for you. It's, 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 I feel it's a good match, and I'm just, like I said, honored to be a part of it. And, you know, they're all my brothers. Everybody's my brother. And, uh, you know, just feel part of the family, and it's, and it's a blessing. Uh, well, you're you're a fantastic musician. Uh, Steve, you shared a cool story uh, the other day. I actually got a question from a listener. We were doing like a listener appreciation event the other night. Okay. So somebody was asking, they said uh, they were they heard this story about you playing in Golden Gate Park with uh, Jerry. And the person said, was that the only time that he had gotten to interact with Jerry and play on stage with him? So I was like, you know, I'm going to write that into the interview. What, yeah, what's probably. the story? Yes. Yeah. That was, so that was it? That was the one and only, you know, like hop up and... Uh, Incredible, though. Yeah. I mean, it's that I can recall. <laughs> <laughs> and that was uh, the 87, the Soviet-American Peace Walk. That's the one. Yeah. That's very cool. Uh, and so, Jeff, on the other side of that, give us a little bit of the uh, what it was like. First time you get to play with the other ones, um, Where, if there's like a, a story of being maybe blown away by anything, maybe you're overcome by just the, the presence of all these dudes, or maybe it just starts to click the reality of the gig that you've just walked into. I mean, just once I like, when those four guys connected and then i heard and i said oh that's the sound you know obviously i was imagining like you know garcia's sound you know playing and stuff and singing in that but i was just saying but hearing that like when it really locked in it was just like i get it the machine that they sort of become it was just it was evident at that point and then i was just kind of oh shit <laughs> <laughs> what did i get myself into here? yeah and i say that because i saw him like 44 times in in stadiums and arenas and stuff along the way which i know is light by deadhead standards but it was it was enough yeah, to show you i had well, some yeah, kind of summer and never right. you know, so. <laughs> it's it's more than than your your average bear had. say again i said i wish i had seen him but it was uh you know, like I said, things work out as they do. And, hey, you're yeah, making up for so, it. Well, I'm trying. Yeah, no, you are for sure. Um, when uh, when I w went through our interview the other day, Steve, I realized the the two cats that we never talked about were uh, Billy and, and Mickey, and you got to work with the Rhythm Devils. What was? Uh, how did that one come up? Oh, well, that was that was lovely. You know, because it was it was kind of. Uh, um, I mean, we played some, we played some of the Dead material, but we also wrote. You know, and so we, we got to like start, you know, start tunes and figure stuff out and everything like that. Just to enjoy that part of the process with those guys. What great. led to that gig? Uh, proximity, I guess. You know, it's um, the same as the rest of the stuff. I was, you know, I was in town. <laughs> I answered the phone. You were convenient. <laughs> Drove over. Exactly. Yeah. Any any particular highlights? Because that was, you've done more than one. Was that one tour or a few tours? What oh, was the other? No, there, there was, there there was a been a bunch of Mickey and, 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 and Mickey and Billy stuff along the way. Um, highlights. A I, fun story. You know, um, I get, I, you know, the, the, the highlights for that for me were just the production when it was big, two drums, bass and guitar. And that was it. Um, because it would just sounded enormous with so few people, you know. So it was that was that was that was a real neat trip. Well, I can imagine. You know, just on a product, just on a production level, it was just like startlingly cool, you know. Right, because it's a different sort of band. You're saying the exactly. rhythm devils. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's not like your average rock band, and and it lends itself into like Mickey's background. Mickey certainly was very into international music, which they call world music in some schools, and a lot of different percussion. Baba Tundi, Ola Tunchi. I remember in, in college playing those records. Um, I, I too was also I had my induction ceremony it was at Madison Square Garden into the Rhythm Devils, where they placed horns on my forehead, <laughs> <laughs> dressed up in devils capes and, and pitchforks and the whole thing. And so that was quite an honor too. So a little bit of part of the Rhythm Devils. So. Yeah. Well, and what a great venue to have your. Uh, that was the first time you got to do anything with them. No, no, no. I was saying that was the my the, the induction ceremony it was like we, we finished the first set. All of a sudden, it was like. Mickey wants to see you in the dressing room right now. You know, so I, I walked around the corner. And I said they were in red satin capes and had pitchforks, and they placed these horns on my forehead. And so that's yeah. that's a pretty cool <laughs> devil incarnation there. I like it. You know, I was Mike reading. Gordon was a part of that. Say again. Mike Gordon was also a part of that. Ah, oh, a little fish activity there. Um, you, one of uh, I was talking to when I was talking to Steve, I mentioned to him uh, Brent. Mi 
at my age, Brent Midland was sort of the guy in the band. He was the new guy to the older fans at the time. But being a young kid, that was my guy. Because I was like, ah, oh, he's not new to me. I love his sound. I love the organ. I love the look in his face. He was very authentic. It was like I'd look at him and think, man, that guy is... Say again? He had the passion, obviously. And it was, uh, I think, a big part of the sound, too, myself. And actually, we, we share the same birthday. And I'm also... I've been playing his organ for years now it's, it's been part of my rig it still is to this day so it's a it's a little ooh. how did that and that was really the question how did you end up playing Brent's rig Steve Parrish he said when Bob had inquired about like getting a B3 into Rat Dog he said he kind of like pulled me aside said we're, we're going to give you this one there's a bunch of neckties on the thing you know on both on both legs gotta leave don't ask leave them and that was it. And then there was a couple of occasions where some people from the audience or whatever started stealing these things. So I had a, a good friend of mine that started replacing them <laughs> with Garcia ties <laughs> that he was purchasing. But it was a, you know, we kept it, we kept honored, you know, and true to that, to where you know the, the ties still remain to this day. They're there. When you come to the show, you'll see them hanging on each leg. And um, so the dead production people had just retained the keyboard that he had used. To send, it's I'm reading. Yeah. If you saw the one that used to have all the stickers all over it, you could st uh, the stickers have been removed, but you can still see all the outlines of, of the stickers, so it's kind of cool. It's a, that is very spooky, though, that you're sitting there playing at his... That's heavy. Yeah, tell me about it. So, so, so far, I guess I'm the longest uh, standing survivor of the, of the chair. <laughs> right. So, and there, that, that way. And that had only that wasn't like, meaning that hadn't been used by previous keyboardists before him. That was his... Uh, not, the, not to my knowledge. Right. Um, when uh, we talked the other day, Steve, I didn't get a Bobby story out of you. You had such a colorful Jerry story. You had all kinds yeah. of folks were, were reacting to that. It was very good on the radio. Um, and you've gotten to, the thing with you and Bobby is you've gotten to do stuff in the past. You're lucky you've got this campfire tour coming up in the, in the future. You've played with him in a variety of different settings. doesn't have to be an onstage story, but it can be. Or it could just be something where maybe you've learned from Bobby. Could be a special guest was there that night. What comes to mind as a, as a uh, moment with him that it can be encapsulized in a story? Okay, so really, really, really long time ago, um, we are on the road. It might have been in like Santa Cruz or Santa Barbara or something like that. Um, it was Southern California, as I recall. Um, Kingfish back then, you know, mm -hmm. somewhere back in the 80s. And we were at the hotel after the gig, and we were entertaining ourselves in the hall room. We had some kind of air pistol, and we had set up some phone books down at the end of the hall, you know, with some targets, some beer cans or whatever, and we were plinking in the hotel. In the, in hall, the hallway of the hotel. In the hallway of the hotel, <laughs> and enjoying ourselves so much, we thought we would, and it was very late at night, but we thought we would... Uh, get the chief and you know see if he'd join the fun so we bang on his door and nothing we bang on his door nothing we bang on his door. He, he eventually he comes out and we'd like we'd wake, woke him up or something like that and he was completely like sleepy you know, time face. yeah like picasso kind of you know sideways thing and we're all standing there we show him the gun <coughs> and uh he holds up a finger and he goes back in he comes out with a mirror like a makeup mirror, right? And he takes the gun, he takes the mirror, and he's still standing in the door, and he's holding the mirror like this, and he's holding the gun over his shoulder, and he's like looking, and he finally gets like the, 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 the view he wants, and pulls the trigger, and hits the fire bell down at the end of the hall. You know, it was like how, like this giant long hall, bang, and rings the bell, and he hands the gun back and goes back in the room. And I, I always thought that was, just like super impressive you know he did it so using the mirror sick and he was so tired but he, he did the you know yeah aiming the using the mirror aiming behind himself with the mirror and, and hit the fire bell yeah well that's it yeah he is a cowboy that's a unique bobby weir story that uh and i don't think do you tell that one too often not too often man but but i i had i had i had the opportunity to tell it uh in his presence recently and uh, he remembered it and confirmed it. So, 
Well, there's some validation true, right there. It's a true story. It sounds it, and now we've documented it yet yet one more time. Um, before we get get go to wrap it up, because I know you got another set coming up here, so I'll let you go in a moment. Um, you were part of Jeff. This uh, they don't like to call it the Grateful Dead reunion of 2015. I was reading a little bit. It's the Fair Lee Wells shows that that occurred. Um, but have, to to fans uh, who simplify things understandably in their own lives, it was the dead back to get the surviving members of the Grateful Dead. They're back together again with a bunch of very uh, talented special guests. Uh, Trey from Fish was there. You were there to talk about when you first found out this was going to be happening. Perhaps somebody calling you, asking you. There must have been some moment when when it clicked. Like, whoa, this is going to be something very special. Well, I remember getting the phone call and I, and I was like, holy cow! I guess this is happening. You who know? called? Uh, management call, and so it was just like this gave me a heads up that this was going to be going on. And again, at the time, don't talk about it yet. You know, we'll just, just see what happens. Yeah. And uh, but it, it all it all formed up, and uh, I think they it went spectacular. You know, it was wow. Just I mean, you walk out in the stadiums and just the energy of like you know eighty thousand people out there. It was just like holy shit. You know, it was awesome. I was like I don't really much more to say. It was just like kind of like. Well, pinching myself, you know. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. You're still, and they're doing pretty large venues again. Yeah, no, Dead and Company's been doing well. You know, we've been doing, you know, been kind of doing some like the baseball arena, uh, arena yeah. stadiums, and uh, you know, and so forth. And uh, you know, it's just been on the rise. And, and we're obviously doing the summer coming up, and we'll see what holds in the near future. But that's been a very positive thing, and everybody seems to be having a, a great time. And, John Mayer's still doing stuff with them. Uh, well, he's doing it, yeah. So, so he's part. He's the main. He's one of the main cats up well, in the front. Yes, he's the piece of dead and company in there, and you know he's spectacular in, in his own right. And guy can play. Yeah, no, no, he definitely can play. Uh, no question about that. And uh, and a final question because you've got a little tour coming up that is a unique one, and I don't know a lot about this whole. Explain, especially for folks who may not be as aware of the Bobby Weir the Campfire Tour. What is ex- exactly that? the cowboy experience oh i mean from from uh from my perspective I and mean, with all the rest of the the uh stuff that's gone on you know with the with the post jerry dead this is the first thing i've seen where the songwriting itself kind of you know like lit me up um these guys have written some really cool material, They're really good tunes, and it's a it's a, a pleasure to, to to play them. So it's it's you know for for me what I'm seeing as I relate to the thing musically, it's just like here's some more stuff for the for the book, you know, that's actually good in that book it works. And what's the format of those shows? It's you get it's you, it's Bobby, who else? There's a band called the National, right? If you're hip mm-hmm. to those guys. Yeah. It's those guys, you know, and an occasional guest. Sometimes we have some singers, or you know, somebody else will hop in. I mean, the last tour, uh, John Mayer hopped in, you know. So you know, it's 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 that, but it's 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 weird, you know, in in you know, doing his cowboy thing. It's beautiful. And music from throughout his legacy. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's a, like a, a set of of new stuff. Normally, you know. Uh, which is fantastic, and and then you know back to some of the uh, the catalog, the older, the older catalog, the book. Yeah. I love it. It's very cool. It's uh, Steve Kimock. It's Jeff Comenti. We really appreciate uh, both you guys. Uh, much luck on this big tour. It was great to meet you today, and and thank you. Thank you very much for having. You are, you are very welcome, and my brother, thank you. Great, uh, thank you for for following up what we did on the phone the other day. I really appreciate it. All right, my pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome.